Hello and welcome to the Underwater United States, exploring the life and ecosystems in the US exclusive economic zone. My name is Ken Kostam, the Director of Research Communications with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and I'll be your host today. We're gonna jump right in. First, I'd like to introduce Keisha Santiago Martinez. Keisha is the Deputy Secretary of State with the New York State Office of Planning, Development and Community Infrastructure. And in her position, she's at the forefront of efforts in New York State to advance sustainable, sustainable equitable and resilient development and to expand New Yorkers access to offshore wind energy, to improve climate resilience and mitigation at regional and local levels and to protect and restore the state's coastal and ocean ecosystems. As the head of Office of Ocean, Office of Planning, Development and Community Infrastructure, she oversees a wide range of policy initiatives and programs, including the New York State Coastal Management Program. And she serves on the governor's Climate Leadership Action Council Executive Steering Committee. And most importantly for us today, she's also the current chair of the five state Mid-Atlantic Regional Council on the Ocean, which she's gonna tell us a little bit more about. Keisha? Great, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. For our wonderful partnership with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, HUI, Marco is so thrilled to present this webinar, Underwater United States Exploring Life and Ecosystems in the U.S. Exclusive Economic Zone, EEZ, Corals and Canyons. In particular, I'd really like to thank Dr. Tim Shank, Associate Scientist and Deep Sea Bi Biologist at HUI, who will be presenting this absolutely stunning material. I'd also like to thank the, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, whose continued support allows Marco to collaborate on projects like this, which yield important data that can be used to inform and guide ocean policy and decision-making. I have the great honor of serving as chair of Marco, which is a regional ocean partnership for the Mid-Atlantic. Established in 2009 by governors from New York, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia, Marco is an interstate collaboration that addresses shared regional priorities and provides collective voice on important ocean issues that transcend political and geographic borders. Dr. Shank's research on mid-Atlantic corals and canyons, which you will learn about during today's webinar, has been an important contribution to building an understanding of deep sea habitats off the mid-Atlantic coast. His research direct, is directly relevant to Marco's goals of helping states and other decision makers in the region maintain sustainable ocean resource use and ocean, healthy ocean ecosystems. Millions of people live along the Mid-Atlantic coast and spend time recreating on its beaches and shores. Yet few people know that far offshore and deep underwater lie some of the most majestic and remarkable features in our ocean. Deep sea canyons run along the underwater coast of the Mid-Atlantic and provide vital habitat to ancient corals and other unique species. Studying these fragile habitats and the hidden and unusual species that live in them is so important to understanding how decisions and daily behavior can impact little known but critical areas of the ocean far away and unseen. Poor water quality can be harmful to slow growing aquatic life like coral, climate change can disrupt water movement and marine debris has even been found in these remote deep sea canyons. Over the next hour, we will cover some of these exciting findings from the 2019 Mid-Atlantic Deep Sea Canyon Expedition. You will learn about the important discoveries gleaned from these unique and poorly understood habitats, which will help raise awareness about their importance. Based on this exploration, our team has also created an ocean story and a story map, which can be found on Marco's website. Detailed information is also available on Marco's Mid-Atlantic Ocean Data Portal, and a link will be sent out to all, uh, all members who are participating in an email after the webinar, along with some additional resources. Once again, I wanna thank you all so very much for joining us today. This is really gonna be an exciting virtual tour for some of Mid-Atlantic's most stunning deep sea canyons and coral colonies. With that, I'd like to turn it back over to Ken. Thanks, Keisha. And I wanna reiterate some of the, the, uh, the uh, that story map that Marco has produced is really stunning. And uh, I can't tell you how pleased we are to be working with Marco to organize this event today. And uh, thanks also for uh, Marco's support of Tim's work. Uh, it's, it's really important to be able to shed light on the canyons and the marine habitats of the Mid-Atlantic. Before we get started, I'd like to take just a, a quick minute to get a sense of where people are tuning in from today. If you joined us on Zoom, you should be able to see a pop-up poll appear on your screen shortly. There it is. 
asking you to indicate the state where you live. Most of these are the states that Marco encompasses, so I imagine we'll have quite a few from those, as well as from Massachusetts, where who is located. If you're not from one of those places, you have just two other options. Uh, click the one that's closest to you. Uh, while, we've, while we're finishing up with the poll, uh, I'd like to give you just a few tips on how to, um, to optimize your Zoom event experience today and how to participate. Uh, later on in the program, our presenter will be taking questions from all of you. Um, if you'd like to participate, please use the Q&A button in the Zoom screen and type your question into the window that appears. Uh, most of you are probably more familiar with the chat feature of, of Zoom meetings, but we've disabled that today for the webinar. So please submit your questions via the Q&A button. If you're watching on the YouTube live stream on the Huey or the Marco channels, um, you can submit questions directly into the comment box and someone from our team will relay them to me. We very often get hundreds of questions, but we'll make every attempt to get as many of you as possible. Um, we've, had, we've had over 500 people register, so we may have a pretty active uh, um, Q&A session. I also want to let you know that we'll be recording the event and the, the event and the recording will be available later on the Hui and the Marco YouTube channels. And let's see, the results are in and though, Keisha, you'd be happy to know that New York is showing a, a distinct lead in, the <laughs> in people tuning in. Okay, uh, let's get started with the main event now. Uh, Tim Shank is a deep sea biologist and an associate scientist in the, in the biology department and also the former director of the Ocean Exploration Institute here at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. He's known for his research on the ecology and evolution of animals that live near deep sea hydrothermal vents on seamounts and in under, underwater canyons and trenches. He's conducted more than 60 scientific expeditions in the Arctic, in the Atlantic, in the Pacific, and in the Indian Oceans, and he's completed more than 50 dives in the research submersible Alvin. He's also conducted more than 100 dives with autonomous underwater and remotely operated vehicles, including making the first use of a one-of-a-kind remotely operated vehicle in some of the ocean's deepest trenches, including one expedition that uh, I was fortunate to be on with him. He's also the author of the award-winning best-selling book, Discovering the Deep. So he is well-placed to tell us all about the, the canyons of the Northeast. So Tim, thanks for being with us. Take it away. Thank you very much, Ken. I really appreciate it. And thank you to Keisha for uh, all those great comments. Um, it's true, I, I've had 28 years of, of exploring and, and doing conducting research in the deep sea and um, I've been all over the world. I've been very fortunate, but I have realized uh, that we have the deep sea right off our coast here. And it's been an amazing um, sense of energy and, and renewal of under, trying to understand the deep sea. Uh, and all its glory and what it means to us and how it impacts us that I'm so thrilled to be here today and add my welcome. Thank you for joining us here today. And let me share some things with you, some things I have never presented before. You're going to learn some new things today. And um, I'm really grateful to be here. Um, it's also not just a single effort. There were people who conducted expeditions with me in the canyons, uh, Dr. Martha Dzinski, um, Taylor Heil and Brian Kinlan and Matt Pody and a lot of others. Um, and the research vessel Bigelow was also instrumental in this. Um, and there's engineers and technologists. Anyway, it's not a one person show. And so I'm gonna, I'll acknowledge them at the end, but I want to do that at the front as well. So anyway, I would love to get started. Let's, um, I always wanna get started by telling people about what it looks like. I, I, I've tried to show them what it's like to be on the seafloor and how far these canyons are away from us. So they're less than a hundred miles in some cases. And so when the first mapping data came out only eight years ago off our own coast, I made this animation to try to show that. And if we could run that animation, you can see here we've got Long Island and Cape Cod in top left. And what we're going to do is I'm going to take you underwater and take you down to the canyons. Here, here's Long Island. We're going to slip underneath Cape Cod because it's so local to us here and go over Stellwagen Bank and the Continental um, Shelf which are over now, relatively flat. And then we're gonna dive over into the deep sea, into the canyons. When the glaciers were retreating 20,000 years ago, um, water, rivers carrying lots of sediment carved out these canyons. Sea, uh, sea level was much lower then. And you can see them all here. There's 90 canyons, over 90, between Canada and the, and the Carolinas. They're astounding, they're massive. They go from 
uh, a quarter mile deep down to uh, two and a half, three miles deep. Here you're seeing some seamounts that are off our coast called the New England seamounts there too. But you can see them all the way down the coast. Just simply amazing. And they're right in our backyard. I think so few people realize, as I did not when I first started working on this, is that 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 the, the amount of land underwater the U.S. has is one and a half times that of the continental U.S. on land. It's simply amazing. And any of these canyons that I'm going to show you today could easily be a, a, a national park if it were on land. In many cases, the majority, I'd say, is that the Grand Canyon could fit inside these canyons, one of these canyons. So they're massive. And yet we know so little about them, we've only just begun to explore them in the last few years. So what I want to do now is get a close-up of some of these canyons, showing you the topography from the mapping that's been done. And so here you see there's this is bathymetry of the seafloor, with the red part being about a quarter mile, quarter mile deep, and the bottom of the green part being about a mile deep. And so you see immediately there's these canyon structures that come out, and they are have lots of topography, rough walls, um, uh, buttresses, uh, lots of hard bottom substrate there because the, the currents the, in this area come from right to left in this image. And they sweep into the canyons and they hit these canyon walls that are completely, I'll say gnarly in, in, their, in their formation. And they are, and the currents whip around in these canyons and bring nutrients up from the deep sea, up toward the surface. And similarly, um, the red part you see here, which is relatively shallow, like the heads of the canyons, this is where we have a lot of plankton, we have a lot of zooplankton, a lot of animal life and plant life that's using photosynthesis to generate a lot of productivity and bring carbon into the system. These animals die and so, and they got fall to the seafloor as carbon. And so there's a lot of productivity in these canyons and it's not just coming up and, and coming from the bottom and coming down from the top through currents, but it, it's also being fed by animal systems that are living there. It's amazing to me to learn that these are hot spots of biological diversity, these canyons, when it comes to whales and dolphins. They flourish in these, in these hot spots of productivity. This graphic you see here, the New England Aquarium, shows that the head of the canyons, the top of the canyons, the red part you see, is loaded with marine mammals. Just in one day of surveying by plane, they see Rizzo's dolphins, 50 humpback whales, 120 fin whales, there's more than 13 species of whales they see and more than 10 species of dolphins, all flourishing because of this nutrient-rich waters that are, that are funneled into the canyons. So these canyons have a major impact on biodiversity and the life that lives there. It feeds everything, including humans. When we first, first came to North America, we really benefited from the fisheries, and I think we still do, from the productivity in these canyons. So to go to the next slide, in, in 2012, we initiated studying these canyons. They weren't even mapped yet through work with Martha Nazinski and others, you can see here the, the canyons we've identified in yellow along the margin of the East Coast here. And we studied for two years the Northern Canyons in the Northeast. And in 2014, we set our sights on surveying the Mid-Atlantic Canyon, see what was in them. They had virtually been unexplored. And uh, we didn't have a submarine or a really, really remote vehicle to go in there and do the first order survey. We needed a really reconnaissance vehicle. Um, and so, I want to click in now and show you just a little bit closer the survey areas that we that we use with this vehicle. Here's a zoom in to show you a couple things. Here are the canyons we looked at in 2014. There were eight of them. Seven here in the Mid-Atlantic. You see how close they are to New Jersey and to Delaware and to Maryland. I mean, these things are, are less than, a, than an hour and a half car drive uh, from the beach, okay? So they're really in our backyard. They are our underwater America. There are, as we have national parks or any lands anywhere, they are, they're part of our country. And yet they remained unexplored until just a few years ago, or even a map for that matter. And so you can see them here distributed as Washington Canyon, Akamak, Leonard, I'm, I'm just reading the names off because you're gonna hear them again and again during this talk. Wilmington, Spencer, Linda Cole, Carret, um, and then many more minor canyons, smaller canyons. If we go to the next slide, I'll show you a subset of these that we looked at. So. Here you see, again, topography of the seafloor. You see the continental shelf in red, basically flat, right? And then you go down into these canyons, Washington Canyon on the far left and Wilmington on the far right. You can see how these cut into the continental shelf. We call them incised canyons. They incise the margin. 
as opposed to like Akamak and Leonard, you see in the middle there that just barely snig the, the, the continental shelf. And so when we first saw these maps, we said, I wonder if the productivity, the energy in these canyons is different. If the ones that incise in the, into the margin, if they're more productive, because there's more of a channeling there, channeling that you can bring down productivity from the shelf and more area for, for animals to live from the nutrients that are being brought up from the deep sea. And you can see how, how far reaching uh, these canyons are. Even to the bottom of this image, you see the canyons continue on sometimes over 400 miles. And so they have a massive impact in, in transferring of energy and productivity in the deep sea. So that was our standing hypothesis. And maybe the incised canyons actually have more productivity, which may mean more life than these smaller minor canyons. And many of these canyons are unexplored and unnamed, as you can see. If you go to the next slide, we'll show you the survey vehicle that we used. It's called TOCAM. It's basically sort of a dope on a rope, but it's a little bit more intelligent than that. It's tethered to the ship. And we taught mine the ship at about a quarter knot, which is a modest walking pace for any human. It has a 24 megapixel camera looking down, batteries on the vehicle. It has, it can measure temperature, depth, um, and it has flash strobe lights, it takes a picture every, every uh, 10 seconds. And so we towed this along the sea floor for maybe eight, eight hours at a time in these canyons, starting from deep and going up to shallow. It logs the images on board the vehicle. We bring it on board, we download the images, and then we analyze the images for whatever life we see in them. And so oh, here's what I want to show you that we saw. Next slide, please. And in these canyons, was just amazing. We found really high diverse deep sea corals and sponge ecosystems in these canyons. And here's just one example. You can see the canyon sort of rock itself. It's like there's, there's a wall here with a large buttress jutting, jutting out. You see lots of these corals, these yellow fan corals, um, all different kinds. Um, to date, we think we've discovered over 70 species of corals that live in these canyons. The next slide will show you just another example. These, you see they have this morphology. They're almost like trees jutting out from the walls. These are uh, called bubblegum corals, which occur in almost like dense forests. They're really amazing. Um, it's hard to get a sense in a still image of, of just the three-dimensionality of these corals and how they dominate. I think we have a a short video here I want to show to give you more of a sense of what this place is like. Um, here you see a, another buttress like this, a slope on the margin of a, of a wall here, just a vertical walls that extend for hundreds of feet. If we, if we roll that video in the first image here, you'll, you'll see that we've even got over 15 corals of different species. It's just amazing. Yeah, and so, and they, and they seem to be layered. They're here because they want that nutrient rich water that's flowing by. It's sweeping all the sediments off these rocks. Here's a, these are mushroom corals and, and they're not like shallow water corals as I'll tell you in a minute. They don't need sunlight. They're, they, li they live in absolute darkness. Here are just scads of single uh, groups of, of stony corals, lots of uh, red crabs, uh, all, all this vertical structure here for these corals to be on. You see this one jutting out. This is a bubblegum coral that's white. Just amazing, but lots of animals living on these corals is one of the things I'm most passionate about is the life that these corals host. And here's a, here's a large hake fish that makes its home around these corals. They actually dig out, some of these species of fish dig out little holes that they live in and create more three-dimensional habitat uh, for these corals and other animals. There's sea stars here. But you can see they're massive. They're, they're maybe six feet more in some of these, in some cases. And so they're just, they're just astounding. And, and we find these in virtually all these canyons, as I'll talk about in just a minute. And here's a close up. You can see there's shrimp living on this Paragorgia, a bubblegum coral, a red one. You can just see the tentacles there. And this is what, I, what I'm going to talk about next is deep water corals. But I want to, these, it's a really good illustration of the polyps that are on these corals. They're not shallow water. Um, type corals. They don't have zooxanthellae or symbiotic algae. They are have feeding polyps that have tentacles on them that grab particles in the water. If we go to the next slide, I'll, I'll give you a description of these deep water corals that seem to dominate these, these canyons. Um, these corals live in darkness or deeper than 50 meters or 150 feet. They love cold temperatures. If things get really warm, I'm thinking of 14 degrees Celsius. I don't know if that's 50 degrees Fahrenheit, something like that. They, get, they don't like it very much. They love to be in strong currents because that's how they feed. Um, they need those nutrients that are coming around this organic material in the water column that's coming by. So they don't have zooxanthellae like shallow water corals. They're super slow growing. 
something that we've we've uh, dated a few of these corals in the right scientific community and, and they can be hundreds of thousands of years old believe it or not and one of the things i really study here is is that how they provide habitat for more than 3500 species around the world so they really are foundation species they're ecosystem engineers uh, in these canyon systems there's, there's four major types of, of corals in the deep sea there are hard corals like you've once seen you pictured here that's white and you see one here that's octocorals in the bottom left they're soft corals. We also have black corals of different types. Well, I'll talk about these in just a second. And also sea pens. These are octocorals that actually love sediment almost exclusively and have a really hard rigid axis and really fleshy polyps. If we go to the next slide, I'll tell you a little more detail about these corals. Here's an example of a stony coral. These, are, these actually build reefs, these colonial corals in the deep sea. Um, and what, what they're stony because they have their skeleton on the outside and the fleshy parts on the inside. Kind of, you know, um, anyway, the next slide will show you a soft coral where it's just reversed, that the skeleton's on the inside. This is a, a very small skeleton here, but there's a thin veneer of tissue over the skeleton, and then you have these polyps. And they're called octocorals because they have eight tentacles that surround the, a mouth, and that is, is what the polyp is. And so they wave these tentacles out, they capture particles, bring it into the mouth. It's simply amazing. Uh, if you go to the next slide, I'll show you a black coral, and um, they have their polyps too, but and they, have, they have six tentacles that make a polyp, but they're linear along, along a branch. They don't, they're not in a circle. That's pretty amazing. And so, Tim, you're probably saying to me, Tim, you know, there's, this is not black, this is orange. Well, black corals can be yellow, white, red, pink. It's the skeleton that's black, and uh, it's that unique skeleton they have that actually people cherish them for jewelry. In this case, a lot of the ones in the canyons are, are this orange color. Um, and they also feed in the water column. If we go to the next slide, I'll comment something about the ecology of these, of these, um, these corals. I mentioned that they're really slow growing. This is an example of one off Hawaii. It's in about 500 meters of water or 1500 feet. It's about, a, about four feet tall or so. And uh, this was sampled and it was dated and it was, it's the oldest living thing we've ever known in the ocean. It's over 4,000 years old. It means these corals are growing microns a year. Uh, which is pretty amazing. And so it means that they're so slow growing that if you happen to disturb one of them, if you knock one of these over or cut off a branch or something, it's going to be a long time, centuries for these things to grow back. Uh, and so we're always cognizant, cognizant of that as scientists, we go out and we only take a small snippet so we can understand who it is and more about its ecology and its evolution. Um, if we go to the, the next slide, this is what something that's near and dear to, to my heart is that these coral species serve as habitat. And this is where all the diversity comes from. And um, in coral ecosystems in the deep sea. And I've got this example here. I'm going to show you a couple here because I love them so much. Here are three different corals uh, in the deep sea. From um, There's a, one on the far left, one in the center that's yellow, and one on the far right that's kind of uh, feathery. And each of them have a brittle star on them. And there's one down below too, actually. There's a white coral down below. It's a hard coral. Um, and they each have a separate, different species of brittle star living on them, yet they're only less than a foot apart, this, this host coral. And so somehow these animals have learned how to recognize a certain species of coral, settle on it, and spend their life there. These are very specific co-evolved relationships that are simply fascinating. We go to the, to the next slide. Here's another example. Here's a, here's a yellow coral, a soft coral, that's got a brittle star on it that will spend its entire life there, we think. And somehow it finds it, it wraps its arms around that coral, it feeds in the water column, we think. Maybe it may clean off the coral and feed off material off the coral. And you also see an enemy here that also lives exclusively on deep water corals. That's pretty amazing. Next slide, please. We'll show you a, a crab that also is, is highly evolved to be and live only on this particular soft coral. It's got legs that have hinges on them that are just shaped right to fit the branch size of this particular coral. And it will live in that coral and it will pick um, organic material off that coral and, and feed and spend its life there. We don't know how they, how they find these places, how they've evolved to be here or anything. We're just noticing that they, they have these patterns of co-occurrence. Another example is in the next slide that I love. This is a black coral. It's a bottle brush shaped coral and it has this crab on it. And every time we see this coral, it seems to have these this, this little crab on it. The crab's about the size of a quarter. It's really small. And when we 
look closely, it usually has a male, a male crab and a female crab on it. And every once in a while, it has a little juvenile crab on it, like it's a family unit. It's, it's simply amazing. These corals may be fostering families in that way. It's one of the hypotheses that we have. But again, to, to show you that these are fantastically diverse and yet unique ecosystems on these corals. It's true too, in the next slide, I'll show you that, that, that fish also have a close relationship with, with deep sea corals as habitats. A lot of fish lay their eggs on, on specific corals. A lot of fish use them as nurseries, as habitats for juveniles. They hide behind them for refuge. Um, there's many ways these, these fish uh, use corals and some fish are known to be around certain corals. And so they're integral to the canyon ecosystem and how it fosters life, uh, life histories for different species. So they're, everything's so tied together integral in these coral ecosystems and they're in, and they're in these canyons. If we go to the next one, it's gonna show you my last example. And this is of one of my favorites. A few years ago, we discovered an egg on one of these corals and we kept noticing more and more eggs only on certain corals. And it turns out it's a Dumbo octopus, an octopus that has these fins that flap as it swims. And before we discovered this, we had no idea of this part of their life cycle of how they actually um, where the eggs are and how they actually hatch and how what the hatchling comes out to be like. And we show a video here. I'm going to show you the one and, and only video of a, of a Dumbo octopus hatching out of a, an egg that was, that was laid on a coral in singly by the, by the mother octopus. Here it is just freshly out of, the, out of the egg in a bucket on the ship. And just a few minutes later, it, it starts flapping. And I put it into a bowl and it, it flapped around in this bowl for, for 10 minutes or so. And we conducted MRIs on this thing um, and uh, learned that it's when it when it hatches out it's got three to six months of yolk it can live off that or it comes out it comes out fully formed it's ready to feed and be a, a full-fledged octopus and so it was an amazing discovery that this happens we've seen in the Pacific too now we've seen these eggs around on corals now we know what to look for and so this intimate relationships we're learning more and more about them every time we go out and so the question became are we going to see these kinds of corals in the Mid-Atlantic Canyons. What are we going to find when we go there? And, and I'm going to show you, if we go to the next slide, I'll show you some of the, some of the examples that we saw here. Here's Wilmington Canyon. Uh, it's one of those that incises the margin and it's, it's a large canyon. You can see in the top left, scads of these solitary hard corals along vertical walls uh, with also with lots of sponges. You can see a bubblegum coral on the top right, extending out into the water column with other corals, soft corals around it. Octopus in the bottom left. Another really large soft coral in the, in, the, in the bottom right. If you look close enough in the center, you'll see a white structure there. That's actually a plastic bag. And I'll talk about that in a little while later. But here, lots of diversity, lots of coral ecosystems here in Wilmington Canyon. If we go to the next one, which is uh, Linden Cole Canyon, another large canyon. On the right, you see soft corals living on the margins of the walls there too, flourishing, doing really well. If you, if you look at the left-hand side, we saw a lot of this in Linden Cole. Canyon and Spencer Canyon, but this these are um, these are skates that um, that occur in large abundances on the margins of these walls, and we saw this a lot with Sanafid branchid eelfish, uh, with hakes and other fish that they would aggregate along these walls. Truly amazing. We see another next example in Spencer Canyon, another Mid Atlantic Canyon, um, close to Linden Cole and Wilmington. On the far left, you're looking down now. Uh, at the top here, um, you see a line of soft uh, hard corals along the margins of the of that wall. Um, my screen went a little bit blurry here, but anyway, there's lots of soft corals here on the right. I mean, the, all the canyons that we saw flourished uh, with with corals, so that's great. So that's good. There are, that's the first question: Are the corals in these canyons? The second question is, you know, because these canyons have such a big impact um, on productivity and diversity. Um, how they host the biodiversity that I was just telling you about uh, to help those, those other animals survive and even evolve. We really want to know the distribution of corals in these canyons. It's really critical to know. And so I'm going to walk you through this carefully here. If you go to the next slide, I'm going to show you this graphic. And, and please bear with me because it's the first time I'm presenting this. And I really appreciate your patience. But on the far left, you've got depth as it, as it descends. 5,800, I'm sorry, 500, 800 meters down to 2,000. Remembering that 800 meters is about a half a mile and 1600 meters is about a mile. And then what I've got on the far right here, the different types of coral we looked at. We looked at 13 different types of corals in these images. There were 46, over 46,000 images that we looked at in, the, in these seven canyons. Um, 
And so you don't have to worry about the coral types. Just look at the colors, the different colors. And what I've got here is a column uh, underneath the word Wilmington. This is Wilmington Canyon. And it shows you the distribution, those colors do, by depth of the different types of corals. And I hope that makes sense. The colors represent different types of corals by depth of the far left side. And so you can see in Wilmington Canyon, we saw corals as shallow as 500 meters. That's, a, that's on the, one of those lines on the far right, uh, all the way down to over 1600 meters and different kinds. Almost every kind of coral was represented in, in Wilmington Canyon. So, okay, great. Now we know something about the distribution of those canyons in Wilmington. What about across all the canyons? In the next graphic here, I'm gonna, here's all the canyons. There's seven canyons here from Accomac, Carteret, Leonard, across the top by depth. And now look at the distribution of those color squares. And you can see immediately that there's some canyons like Accomac and Carteret and Leonard on the far left that seem to have fewer um, corals, coral types there, whereas the other four canyons have really lots and distribute over a long, long range. And so you might say, well, gee, maybe you didn't look hard enough for the wrong spot, or, you know, maybe you only did one survey, you know, in Accomac and you did 10 surveys in Wilmington. Well, the reality is right. It's a good question to ask for all you scientists that are watching. If you go click on the next slide, I'm going to show you the depth range that we surveyed with this towed camera system. And so you can see in Accomac, we just had one tow and it was shallow, five to 800 meters, you know, down to, down to half a mile. We did find corals down there, soft corals were down there. Um, but you look in Carteret, the next canyon over, and then we did four surveys there that spanned 500 down to 1800 meters. And still, we only really saw corals at about 1200 meters. And so, it's clear to me, if you look across the breadth between 500 and 800 meters, there's very little in the way of, of coral that we saw. We saw a lot of sedimented habitat. This is the head of the canyons, the highest part of the canyons, loads of sediment there, ready to fall down into the canyons and get dispersed and disperse all that organic material. But as you got to 800 meters, down to 16, 1700 meters, lots of diversity, but still lower in Carteret and, and Leonard. And so even we saw corals all the way down to 2000 meters. If you look at Linden Cole, for example, in the middle there, you can see, or even Spencer there, I'm sorry, Spencer, there's almost continuous coverage there of our surveys as well as the corals that we observed. So almost everywhere we looked in Linden Cole and Spencer, we saw corals. So um, that's what could explain this observation of having less corals in those three, other, those three canyons and more diverse diversity and broader range of corals in those four canyons on the right. Well, go to the next slide. And here's one hypothesis is that as we started out with, the four canyons on the far right inside the shelf, they cut into the shelf, allowing more nutrients and productivity and downwelling currents to come down into the canyon and bring nutrients, as opposed to the other three, which were much shorter, much smaller canyons that don't inside the shelf. So our hypothesis is still is supported here. This is the case. Unfortunately, we take this hypothesis up to the New England canyons, doesn't hold up. We see a lot of diversity in the non incised shelves. We've got more exploration to do to understand really what's happening. The other hypothesis is really it's habitat based. There's really more habitat for deep water corals in the incised uh, canyons than, than the non incised canyons. So there's more. So I put this graphic up here too to show you. Same sort of structure, depth from the far left, coral types by, col by color, but across the top, instead of there being canyons, there's different types of habitats. So we looked at nine different types of habitats that the corals were attached to. If you look on the far left, far right column to the vertical walls that had the most, look at that, the distribution of vertical walls hosted canyons, hosted corals almost every time, excuse me, hard corals, especially uh, um, solitary cup corals like, that look much like mushrooms all the way to, to large colonial ones. But you can see that the vertical walls had the most coral, um, sort of as, as coral habitat for most corals in the tops of those walls also serve as habitats. Sediments were also high when it came to things like sea pens that really like, like uh, sediments is in boulders also had a lot. So it could be just the availability of the habitat uh, and whether these things are incised or not. It's also going to be what nutrients are available and what, what's raining down to them, what's being brought down to the corals and what's coming up from the bottom uh, as well. And so next slide, please. I want to make sure that I have a few minutes anyway to discuss 
you know, I just told you about the great diversity that's here and how slow growing these corals are and how they are the foundation species for providing a, a linkages to the productivity um, in and out of a canyon. But they, they face many threats and they're, they're pretty serious threats. Um, first and foremost is ocean warming. We're already seeing a change in deep water temperature and shallow water temperature around these canyons. Certainly seeing them on the shelf, this, these changes. In fact, we've seen lobsters, for example, uh, that are no longer in Rhode Island and Connecticut. They're actually migrating northward to get, go to cooler waters. And we're seeing that more even with deep water fish. Um, there's some accounts of that. And so temperature, we have a changing ocean, folks, and we're not going to stop that from happening right now. And so what we're critical for us to do is to understand how that ocean warming is going to change where life in the canyons and our deep sea off our coast is, is going to be. Are the corals going to shift their distribution? Are the animals living on them? Are they going to be able to shift their distribution and survive? We don't know. But we need to get out there with baselines first and foremost to understand where things are in projects like this one, supported by, in part by Marco, uh, the deep, um, deep Sea Research and Technology Corals Program, and, and um, as well as um, the, the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation. It was made this all possible and gives us the first insights into this. But Ocean acidification is another one. We've got, you know, increase, we got decreasing pH, increasing CO2 going into our oceans. Uh, oceans are absorbing over a third of the, of the content of the CO2 that, we're, that humans are putting into the atmosphere. What happens if it gets too acidic, these corals have, have calcium carbonate skeletons that grow so slowly, they won't be able to grow. They'll actually disintegrate or dissolve uh, faster than they can actually grow them. So all that coral foundations are lost, all that diversity is lost, and that's a serious issue. We also have extractive industries, and that's why I have this picture, uh, the Deepwater Horizon, where we also worked on deepwater corals associated with that. We did see damage to coral life uh, uh, due to that um, spill in the, in the Gulf of Mexico 10 years ago. Um, and we also have extractive energies like bottom fishing, trawling of the bottom. That's a picture in the bottom right uh, off of um, Australia, actually. Uh, when they brought up all that is stony corals you see in there. It could be thousands of years of growth taken away in a day. And, and uh, we also see a lot of marine debris. And of the 40 canyons we've surveyed to date, we've seen trash, human trash in each one of them. Plastic, metal, um, things that throw from fishing, like you see in the top right, like nets and traps. We see that a lot um, in, a very, in varying depths. Uh, so anyway, I, I want to make sure we have some time for questions. I'm going to go to the next slide. Uh, and then wrap up. I want to talk about sort of the future, what we're going to do now and what's important to do now. We need more exploration. If I, if I could tell you our surveys were only, you know, maybe a kilometer long, uh, less than a mile long, um, each one of them, most likely yielding about 2,000 images. It's hardly really a robust way of systematic exploring and learning what's there. If I were to put a dot on this map inside these canyons for, where, for the length we covered, you wouldn't be able to see it. It's tiny. Um, and so we need more exploration to know what's there so we can look at the patterns and make our hypotheses and try to dis discover more and give more information to management councils and whatnot for their decisions on how to manage these resources. But we also need to examine the role that canyons play in really controlling sustaining biodiversity. And that is what maintains these corals and the health of these corals and, and the health of the animals that live on them. We also need to understand, you know, well, I just told you that canyons are not all alike. They have different species in different canyons, different diversity at different depths. And so what's in Wilmington Canyon or Washington Canyons, not what's in Akimak or Leonard Canyon. And so the question we have now then is, does Washington Canyon feed other canyons? Are they the source of larvae and diversity for other canyons? And do Akimak and Leonard Canyon, which are smaller and don't have, his, have the diversity, are those sinks? Do corals go there and really don't propagate out and, and become part of the diversity for the future? We can understand whether that's happening or not, if we can get to these places and actually get physical samples of these animals and look at their genetics. It's, and if they're not getting out, if they're not providing DNA, or sorry, they're not providing diversity to other canyons, then they may actually be generating new species. These things are living in isolation. They can't escape the canyons. They're just evolving in situ. And that's why we have so much diversity in these canyons is the canyons are helping to form or generate this, these new species. And lastly, I've already mentioned it, but we need to really understand the impacts of climate change. It's, it's, it's phenomenal that we're already seeing shallow water species move. With some people talking about, they're seeing deep water fish move northward. And, and so 
if we're not out in front of this, we're not going to know what's going to happen and the changes that are going to occur and how they're going to impact this diversity, which ultimately impacts humans uh, and our food. Lastly, you can, you can learn more about all the things I've talked about today in a report that's available um, on the Marco website. It's at midatlanticocean.org. Um, and so please check that out if you will. And that ocean story they put together too, that goes canyon by canyon as does a report about what we found there and what we're learning. And so lastly, I really want to thank um, a lot of people and certainly the chief scientist of the, of the missions. We have Martha Nizinski with, with NOAA Fisheries, uh, Taylor Heil and Luke McCartan, who were here, who did a lot of the image analysis and work on this, merging the navigation from, we had from the vehicle to find out exactly where these corals and all these all this diversity was or is. Um, and certainly want to thank the NOAA Deep Sea Core Research and Technology Program for their initial support to make those missions happen at sea. The captain and crew with the Bigelow and the te te technical team that's with the camera system. And, and certainly um, the support given in part by Marco and the, Get the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation to make today possible. And, and thank uh, Huey and Marco for hosting this event today. I really appreciate it. And now I'm ready for any questions you might have. Thanks so much for, for listening. Wow, that was fantastic. Thanks. <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I, I consider myself fortunate to be able to, to hear you talk about this repeatedly. You know, I've heard, that, I've heard you give presentations like this many, many times, and I've learned something new every time. And, um, and, and by the look of the questions we're getting, you know, a lot of people are, are, are picking up, are, are getting a lot of things, but I'm going to, I want to issue. I want to exercise moderator's prerogative, and um, ask a, a quick question on, of my own first. You know, the fact that I'm I learn something new every time I think is not an indication of my lack of attention to what you're saying. But you said because you said something repeatedly when you were talking about the some of the um, some of the organisms that live on the corals. You kept saying, "We think," or "We hypothesize," or "We we don't know." And I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit more to that level of, of, of newness to science and what you're just learning and what there is still yet to learn that you, th you think you can learn or what's even beyond that. Yeah, that's a great question, Ken. And I, th I think, you know, we're still in the exploratory phase. This is still Lewis and Clark on, on U.S. land. It's just underwater. And, and we get such little time to be down there, um, to be able to see things, you know, in real time and look at the associations of the animals like you mentioned that we don't know. We're just identifying the patterns. And, and it's so exploratory. You know, last year we had, a, we had uh, three dives in one of the canyons in the Northeast. And we may have had four hours per dive in a submarine. And we sampled, we made nine samples of corals. And three of them we think are, are, are new to science. They were uh, bubblegum corals. I mean, if, if we go down and, and, and we have just a few hours to be able to, I mean, the, the learning curve is, is astronomical because we're learning so quickly. With each species comes a, a different evolutionary history, a different coevolution with the animals it lives on, maybe in what habitat it lives in. You know, it's, it's astounding. The que we have so many more questions than answers, but the value of asking these questions is so valuable in and of itself. We, we want to know what lives there because I'm really now starting to see just through this Marco work, frankly, the links between the, the marine mammal systems that in some of these whales dive down to 2000 meters, okay? That they are interacting with the corals. They're interacting, they're scooping up sediments on the seafloor. They're feeding down there. They're defecating down there. They are sloughing off a lot of material as they go. And so I feel like there's this connection with the deep sea to the shallow water that's, that's almost, it's, that we can see through the lens of these canyons we can't see anywhere else. It's, it's astounding to me that this is just, after 28 years of doing this, thinking that I was going to remote places around the world, I was going two miles down, three miles down in submarines to an alien world. It's fascinating. But here we see, for, for me, for the first time, the impact and linkages that are happening. And we don't have the physical measurements yet to understand the currents that are happening down there in, these, in, in, a, in a single canyon to really know what's happening yet um, over periods of time. So I don't want to be a long-winded answer, but we are on the we are on the massive exploration phase and just its cusp, and so that's why this program was so valuable to to get the initial reconnaissance, even to be talking about these questions. Um, that sort of jumps into a question here that that 
that Carolyn has, um, and Carolyn is a, a middle school teacher we know in, in Massachusetts. She says she studies the sea, she studied the sea star. It's a Hen Henricia genus. I can't get the species name right if I tried. And that, that live on sponges and subtidal ecosystems in grad school. And she, she asked, have you found any sea star symbionts on deep sea corals? I saw what looked like a hypisteria in one of your photos, but it was on the <laughs> seafloor. And I think that gets to the question of, is, are there more connections into the shallow shallow shelf that you might not know about in the canyons. It's, it's true, Ken, that the, um, we'd see both of those genera uh, in the deep sea, in the canyons, and mostly when we see sea stars that are predators on corals. They love to eat corals and they will sit there for what we think are months at the rate that they would feed. And they eat the coral polyps and they go down individual branches. And so that's just in the last year, two years, that's become uh, of intense interest, how things are feeding on these corals and the rates of their feeding. Um, and it's interesting you mentioned the connection again, and, and I, I didn't mention that the, the largest migration on Earth occurs in the water column um, in the deep sea as, as things move up and down day and night uh, to be in sunlight, to take advantage of things, and then to hide in the, in the deep, dark sea uh, when predators are coming out. Uh, but I didn't also felt, you know, you, I did show a picture, I think, or a video of a red crab. And, and there's a large red crab populations in these canyons, and they migrate. Uh, hundreds of meters, if not kilometers a day, going up and down. They're constantly moving. Uh, and they're part of that transfer of energy and productivity up and down the connectivity uh, mm -hmm. into the canyons. It's also one of the fisheries that we have, red, red, red crabs are, but so they're, they're really important. I, um, there's more and more examples of how these things are connected. I think Carolyn's picking up on that too. Yeah, and then we had another question here from Elva talking, asking about that, that vertical connection as well. As, you know, have, have there been any studies done about the relationship between surface productivity and the incised or the unincised canyons? Do we know what, what that mechanism is? Yeah, the, sh the short answer is there's no, there's been no real you know, comprehensive study that's, that's looked at that um, in, a, in a single canyon. All right, well, you, know, Alva, the, the, you got a PhD uh, yeah. topic right there. That's a great topic. <laughs> Um, but I think, you know, all of this really points to something because you, you mentioned that, you know, these, the, the corals are some of the, the slowest growing organisms on the plant, in, in the marine environment, but really it's a very dynamic place. Things are changing constantly in and around these very, very slow growing organisms that seem to have an anchor effect to many of the ecosystems. It's, it's really true. You, it's one, you wonder how they're able to cope with with the changing or how they're able to adapt to changing environment. And, and I think that they have, I, I don't know how they do it. You know, there are people out there that are, that are seeking out genes that are, will be adapted for changing climatic conditions in corals. Um, and, and that search continues. Some feel like they found things and, but you know, it, I, the answer is, I don't know. I really don't know. <laughs> I, I do know this. We did a study on, on fossil coral, these single hard um, solitary corals uh, like like mushrooms, and we studied. We we went and sampled those along the seamounts of the Atlantic, at different depth ranges, and we were able to date those, and look at that and how that dating relied. To, I'm sorry, corresponded to where they were at depth, and and with that age of of the coral, to climatic changes, and it showed that those sh those solitary corals actually migrated up and down with depth, over changing climatic conditions on the order of thousands of years. So where they were 15,000 years ago versus 20,000 years ago versus 75,000 years ago, they would have checked that, check that um, or track those changes over that climatic time scale. And so it's clear that corals do respond over that kind of time length. But if you change the system really fast, we don't know. And that's why I think it's absolutely critical for us. It's our backyard. It's right here. We have the technology to do it, to form baselines in these, in these canyons and set up places where we can look at these areas over time and how they change. One of the things I didn't mention was that they're slower growing, yes, but they don't, we don't see them colonize. We really don't see areas where massive colonization is taking place and these little small corals are there. We don't see it. And so we, they may be seriously slow to colonize or recolonize an area, one that's disturbed, or one where they've got to migrate to somewhere else because of the climatic conditions, or the oceanographic conditions aren't, aren't good for them, so. 
We've had several people asking both on Zoom and um, on, on YouTube, how are the canyons named? Because some of them seem to relate to uh, places on land. Some of them are people's names. They're, they're mostly, from what I know, they're mostly named after people. Um, like the governor of the state, I think it was a governor Carteret, I think, if I remember right. Um, we just had a most recent name was uh, Kenlin Canyon here in the Northeast. Yeah, there's some of the names there you see. Yeah. And I, you know, I can't explain, I mean, maybe Wilmington and Baltimore are obvious. I don't know, Norfolk are place names. Washington's a place name. But, um, and then you have things like Alvin and, and Atlantis and Nantucket there that are named after, I think, um, the Alvin and Atlantis uh, the ship and the, and the submarine. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the most recent one named was after Brian Kinlan, which is a good, was a good friend and colleague who went on these initial missions in the Northeast. He was a, a modeler of, of habitats and life in those habitats for Noah, and he, he passed away a few years ago, and we honored him, him by naming a canyon after him. So Kinlan Canyon's up in the Northeast. So we, we spoke about the, the canyons, and you, you mentioned how many of them were originally formed uh, during the deglaciation. Um, but um, Mort here on Zoom is asking, or no, I'm sorry, not Mort. Um, John is asking, uh, what about the, uh, the seamounts? How are they formed? Seamounts were formed from a hot spot of, of volcanic activity in the middle of the Atlantic. And as this, as it's the western part of the, the Atlantic seafloor moved northwest over hundreds of millions of years, that it tracks that hot spot. So it created a seamount. The seamount migrated on top of the plate, the oceanographic plate that's a seafloor, and it migrated toward New York, frankly. And so these are sort of extinct volcanoes, hot spots. In fact, if you if you really look at the geology, that New England Seamount range traverses all the way up into northern New, uh, New York as mountains. Uh, Thomas was asking uh, also, what, um, what's the, the water temperature for, the, for these corals? I mean, we're familiar, I think a lot of people are familiar with maybe scuba diving on reefs and, yeah. you know, in warm tropical waters. Well, what's it like in, for, the, for these corals? We see these corals at, at uh, deep water temperatures of four degrees Celsius, five degrees Celsius, seven degrees Celsius. I'm sorry, I'm not doing it in Fahrenheit. I can't think that way. <laughs> it's just not my language. I'm sorry. 37, 40, somewhere. Yeah. And so I know that, that hard, um, hard corals like Lophilia, the reef building uh, coral Lophilia, um, really doesn't like hot temp, warm temperatures. If it gets more than 14 degrees Celsius, again, I don't know what that is exactly, it really starts to die. And that's one of our concerns is people are trying to look at the different temperatures that these corals are living at and seeing what their boundary conditions are. Um, and so we don't have it for a lot of corals. It's very hard to, to rear them and keep them in aquaria in your lab. You can do it. Whether you can simulate really deep sea environment is another question, but you can keep them alive and expose them to temperatures and see how they do. But um, we've seen um, warming in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, that's impacted Ophelia um, reefs uh, when, they get, uh, when they get warmer. Um, you know, we've we've been talking about the U.S. East Coast, and I know you showed an image from of a deepwater coral in Hawaii. But where else are, are deepwater corals found? Deepwater corals are found all over the world. There, um, there's probably over two hundred thousand seamounts around the, in the deep ocean, and corals love to be on up structures like that, like seamounts. They're on uh, ocean ridges, which encircle the, the deep sea floor around the around the world. Um, they're in canyons around the world. There's canyons in the Arctic. There's canyons off of uh, New Zealand. I mean, every continental margin seems to have um, canyons of some sort. And so they are, we believe, um, around the world. And we see them uh, as deep as um, 6,500 meters or so around there. Um, so they go really deep, too. Allison is asking, um you know, the difference that you see in species, you, you've noted the differences in, in species that yeah. you saw in, in each of the canyons. Have you also noticed any uh, physical or chemical differences in, in the movement of water or in the, the composition of seawater that, that might speak to some of those differences? That's a great question. And people are looking at that now. We haven't done that in the canyons yet. We haven't really had that access to, in, mm -hmm. to the data and whatnot. That's our next step, I think. But we've, we, there are people who are doing it in the Pacific that have done it really well uh, on seamounts in the Pacific, looking at different, um, not just temperatures, but, but water masses that have different salinities, uh, densities and, and temperatures and whatnot and how, how they, and they're seeing a, a correlation between 
coral types and water mass types with those properties. Um, it's often hard to distinguish between the impact of depth on a given species of coral, for example, versus temperature, because they co they co vary together. As you get deeper, you get colder. Yeah. And so determining what individual factor might be controlling the distribution or a range of a single species it can be really difficult. But you can come up with a set of, of observations that can limit uh, the alternatives, the options. So the so there is there is evidence that coral groups of groups of coral species are found in certain water masses uh, in the Pacific on different seamounts. Are there similar canyons on the West Coast, John is asking? There are. There are canyons on the West Coast uh, off, of, off of California and whatnot that have been uh, studied quite a bit. Um, the, you know, the, the, because of the tectonics of the North America, the, the deep sea occurs very close to the margin there. And so uh, it drops like it's all a, a canyon. And then within that drop, you have gullies that become a canyon. Uh, and so they have been well studied. They have corals, they have sponges, they have lots of fish there. Um, the deep sea is amazing. If you if you give it the deep sea some hard bottom or even some sediments, there's going to be lots of life there. Yeah. It's it's really a, it really is truly amazing. Life will so, always yeah. find a way. Yeah, it's true. You know, I I gave this sort of very broad litany of the places you've been at the start of the program, and um, you know I've been fortunate to to be on a couple of expeditions to you. One of them, you know, very exotic place just north of of New Zealand to the to the Kermadec Trench, one of the deepest places on Earth, and yet as you said, right here in our backyard, we have this amazing diversity and this amazing abundance of life. How does, how does this place that we might, you know, overlook because it seems, oh, well, it's just our backyard. How does this place compare to some of the other places you've been to around the world over the years? <laughs> wow. I mean, that's like a half hour answer, but I think yeah, I know. <laughs> I've, been, I've, been, I've studied hydrothermal vents. I mean, I've, I've witnessed, yeah. you know, the only, seafloor eruption that was really witnessed by one, by a person's eye. And there's some amazing places that I've gone to. I've been very fortunate. But I, I think I think to the point of your question is is that these the, the these canyons, our deep sea and you know that's right here off our coast, is is a window to access we don't have other places. Right? We have the technology, we have the ability to get to these places in in, in less than a day. You know, and, and, uh, without the great expense, and so it's a, it's a it's a living laboratory for us right here off our coast. And the fact that we have multiple and different kinds of canyons is a is such a natural laboratory setup, ready to go. You know, so I'm I'm talking to to, to marine mammal people for the first time in my life, and how that how that might interact with deep water corals and how they might supply each other with with energy, productivity, carbon. You know, I think that you know it's hard to compare hydrothermal vents and exploding volcanoes on the seafloor um, to whale carcasses on the seafloor that have a whole unique set of life on them to to a canyon there there you know I, I think the value here uh, in terms of what we can learn now in the next generation of deep ocean science is is dramatic it's un, it's really I mean people are going to catch on to these canyons are right here and we can do a lot of time series studies here um, that are going to revolutionize the way we think about how life can live in the deep ocean and on earth. That, I think that that speaks to what makes them so special is the potential for learning. You know, one of my, my favorite times in a lab on a ship is when something comes into the lab straight off of the seafloor and people like you look at it and go, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> we, we have time we, for a We've Sorry, done that many times. I remember I had, oh, there were 28 biologists on board. We brought something up from uh, seven miles down, 10,000 meters in the Kermadec Trench where you were there, Ken. And these are, these are the world's leading biologists that felt like, you know, and, and we had no idea what, what phylum to put this animal in. And it was ridiculous. I mean, that, that, mm -hmm. I think that's why I do it from the sense of discovery and amazement. So, um, hope, yeah. And you can do that right here. You, as you were saying, you discovered three, three new species just on, a handful of sub dives just two years ago. Yeah, and we were myopically just looking for corals too, and the different corals right. that were there. We weren't looking for all the other things that are there. And we know that species in the sediment that we can't see are really diverse in these canyons. Didn't even really get to that, but all this organic material that's landing on the seafloor and going deep into the sediments, it's just it's it's they're thriving down there because of that productivity. And we really need need to get a better handle on how that how those things are all related. Um, we've got time for a couple of questions. Um, just. Quickly, Elise is asking, what can, what can people do 
to help these canyons, to help them thrive and, and just that? What, what can people well, do? You know, I, I, would, I would say, um, you know, the human impact in the canyons is, can be seen visually by the, just the, the amount of trash we've seen, the, the plastic that we've seen, the plastic bags and magazines, and I've seen toilets and showers, and I've seen airplane engines, and there's, there's all kinds of cans of all sorts, you know, um, soda cans. I mean, it's just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, where you see there's a piece of black plastic there in the center of the screen on, on the sedimented seafloor. And then we see lots of nets. It's just, just how it's how it is. And you know, I, I don't. What do it, it? You know, don't litter. You know, don't don't. You know, um, I think you know we, we could talk about not littering or, or stop the stream of plastics or whatnot. And that's and that's always mindful thing to do. But I think we need to change the way we think. If you can do that, if you can influence people that make decisions about about funding research, about learning more about these things, about people that want to make television programs about this, to educate people about our ocean and how it impacts us every day. I'm learning learning more and more about that all the time. I used to actually think that our deep sea was remote and it didn't impact us at all. And now I know that the deep sea is coming up to meet us in the shallow waters off our coast here in these canyons. And I, and I, I know that the food that I'm eating at dinner came from near or in these canyons Jonah crab, red crab, whatever, that, that's, you know, that's it's vital for us. I get that, you know, I'm not a scientist who's, who's advocating any, any which way except for information. My goal here, my job here is to try to give information to people, to make good decisions, to educate you, the public, about what we're learning. I'll learn with you as we go and, and be more intelligent about the decisions we make. If you value the deep sea, your oceanography, your oceans at all that control your daily weather and your climate every day, um, then 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 behave like it, make it part of your life, make it make yourself aware of it. Um, last question: What's next for this for this data and for the work that you're doing? And so the, the these data are tremendous because what we can do with this depth location of corals by depth and by these by the maps we showed you, we we know the slopes of the of the habitats the corals are on. So we know that now from this work that if a slope in a canyon is over 45 degrees, we're really likely to see corals of a certain kind. We see vertical walls, we're likely to see hard corals and certain soft corals. And so we can put those in models now and predict where, where we can't go and explore, but we see these slopes, these vertical walls, that this kind of corals ought to be there. And by predicting that, we can say, hey, what's it gonna, what should it look like? How many corals are really down there? How much are they producing? How much are they giving to habitat to the other animals? I mean, to launch pad, this, these data are, is, is our launch pad for predictive modeling of where things should be for biodiversity for, through the corals and what our plans should be next uh, to explore, to where do we go to? I mean, I wanna go there and sample corals and look at how they've co-evolved with the animals living on them. I need physical samples of the DNA to do that. And so where am I going to strategically target where to go? And changes with depth I'm going to look at and across these canyons. And so, you know, if we can model where they should be, that's a much greater chance of getting to these corals and making really massive discoveries. All right. Thank you, Tim. I think well, that's all, all the time we have for, uh, for questions today. Um, before we close, I want to say again, a big thank you to, to, to Keisha and to Marco and to Tim for, um, for sharing your, your, your thoughts and your insights with us. Um, especially thank you to Marco for helping make this happen today and to the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation uh, for their continuing support of Tim's work and, and the work and the important work that Marco is doing. Uh, and I wanna thank all my Hui colleagues who helped make this happen, who've been working behind the scenes. Um, finally, uh, Craig, if we could pull up that last slide. Um, if you want to learn more about the canyons off the east coast of the U.S. and their importance to a healthy ocean, you can visit uh, Tim's lab site, shanklab.hui.edu, or the Marco website, midatlantic.org. Uh, you can also visit uh, the Hui homepage, whoi.edu, for uh, information about the, the ocean in general. Um, and um, you'll find more resources both at the, the, at the Hui website and at the Marco website um, 
like I said, general, but also specific to this topic about the, uh, the Mid-Atlantic Canyons. That's all the time we have. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. And once again, um, stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you.